Moving on now to RoboDebt news. RoboDebt, the trauma that just keeps giving. Giving me nightmares, giving me a hole in my bank account, giving me another form of generational trauma to hand down to my children. So generous. RoboDebt is in the news again as the Royal Commission has wrapped up and boy oh boy is it delivering the goods. While the final report on the Commission isn't due until the 18th of April 2023, that just means that we have months of treats ahead of us. Treats that come in the form of public servants feeding us bite-sized chunklets of schadenfreude. It's like watching an episode of Utopia, but those guys only hurt themselves. Long-term listeners of the show will be very familiar with RoboDebt, as we have covered it a number of times. But for first-time listeners, RoboDebt simply is the name given to a series of illegal debts given to welfare recipients, which led to a series of those recipients committing suicide and lawsuits where the government had to repay most of the debts generated by the system. So all that, but with jokes! <laughs> and now we have a royal commission with the Albanese government coming good on its election promise to publicly humiliate the Morrison government by using his mortal enemy, the law. Seems government departments failed to obtain high-level external legal advice about RoboDebt despite their own lawyers questioning the legality of the scheme more than a year before it was implemented. But in what has proved to be the coalition's go-to move, they buried their head in the sand, along with their moral conscience, any sense of responsibility, our treatment of refugees, and Australia's dark past of murdering indigenous people. Must be crowded down there in the sand. This is why we are always digging stuff up. We need room to bury our increasing collection of secrets. This was raised on the first day of the Royal Commission, a real home run early on in the Royal Commission. Now, we don't want to get too ahead of ourselves, but I can see a mini series or a documentary podcast retrospective created by Mark Fennell in the future. The advice was that the use of average data was not supported on policy grounds and could cause reputational damage to the Department of Human Services, now known as Services Australia. A big ask, given it's the department that handles everyone's favourite and most well-respected government departments, Centrelink, Workforce Australia and the ATO. It's essentially the department of punishing the poor. The Commonwealth acknowledges that raising debts purely by averaging taxation data was unlawful, and that imposing a penalty fee based on the information that it had was unlawful. Unlawful in Australia means it's a breach of civil law, which are disputes between people and or companies over money slash compensation slash damages. Now, it turns out the inspiration for RoboDebt came from a particularly stupid place. So this was all around the time the copyright holders had been sending speculative invoices on a mass scale to people who may have illegally downloaded films that was known at the time as the Dallas Buyers Club saga. The two events have similarities in that they both used mass information grabs of Australian citizens and both were so poorly thought out they failed to achieve anything except waste a ton of money while trying to recoup supposedly lost money. The earliest reference so far to the origins of what would later become a robo-debt was a DHS minute prepared for and signed by the then National Manager of the Business Integrity Division, Scott Britton, on June 30th, 2014. Britton would go on to be so proud of his work and that of his number one in charge of RoboDebt, Jason Ryman, that he'd nominate Ryman for an Australia Day Achievement Award. In recognition of Mr Ryman's significant role, his boss Scott Britton nominated him for a 2017 Australia Day Achievement Award. And that's a real shame that he didn't get it. Seriously, I can't think of a better day to honour someone who helped build the systemic oppression and persecution of an entire section of Australian society than Australia Day. In the great tradition of people doing something terrible and then moving on without consequence, Scott Britton still works in the government. His current title is 
appropriately, Chief Risk Officer Branch Manager of Fraud Intelligence and Investigations for the NDIA, the insurance agency of the NDIS. Which, if you haven't heard, is doing an excellent job of keeping people from committing fraud by stopping as many people as possible from getting access to the payment. See? Nobody can accuse him of not doing his job. While we're talking about jobs being done, Cameron Brown, former Director of Payment Integrity and Debt Management at DSS, learned of the idea to tighten Centrelink Welfare Debt Collection in late 2014. He was almost immediately concerned. That is a quote. Presumably, he took a moment to internalise a moment of incredulity or make an inquiry as to whether it was a fucking joke or not before allowing the reality of it, the idea, to fully sink in. Otherwise, surely he would have been immediately disturbed. Brown sought legal advice that turned out to be damning. The idea, and this is a quote from the legal advice, may not be derived within the legislative framework. Just a nice legal way of writing, are you fucking kidding? Who would try to do this monstrously unethical thing? Have you considered alternative means of building up the government's coffers to the point where they overflow, like, I don't know, taxing businesses' profits, or cutting public servants' pays, or before immediately trying to claw back the scraps given to the poorest members of society? Then that advice disappeared. What happened to this legal advice is, one of the central questions being investigated by the Royal Commission. Kind of like a giant game of Cluedo, where we all try to solve the mystery of who killed the hopes and dreams of an entire class of people. The hearings have revealed there were several crucial crossroad moments at which rubber debt could have been averted. Or stopped much earlier than it was. But then a hero came along. A man who never met an ethical conundrum he would be stopped by. A man above all the politic of what is and isn't lawful. A man of the people in the same way that Judas was a man of the apostles, but definitely had different intentions in the end. A little known hero named Scott Morrison. The idea of automating debt against the poor was the kind of idea that Scott Morrison could get behind. He is a man of the church, and if there is one lesson that Jesus taught us, it is to let go of our attachment to material possessions. For it is easier to get a camel through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. And Scott Morrison was preparing so many people to get into heaven. So he catapulted a fledgling debt recovery idea into a serious policy proposal to be considered for the upcoming budget. Now, on the third day of the hearings, the inquiry was told that nearly four years later, after the rubber debt scheme was up and running, the Department of Social Services received external legal advice, also casting significant doubt on the scheme's lawfulness. Taking the wily coyote running over a cliff approach to the law. If I don't look down, then I can't fall. It's why I never look in my wallet. You know, that way there's never the possibility of no money. I wouldn't want to ruin the possibility of that by confirming it. That's how it works. The inquiry heard the law firm was paid for the draft advice, but it remains unclear whether it was finalized or how it was subsequently used. In a manoeuvre now known as the Coalition Special. They like to bury things so much, I think it's fair to assume that they are in the pocket of Big Shovel. The problem is, this was in the days before Morrison hired his wife as his personal empathy consultant. After which, he never made another mistake again. What's that? Oh. Oh, well that's a lot of... Mm. Oh dear. Well, let's not dwell too long on that. Let's get back to the matter at hand. Morrison designed the scheme to claw back any dollars that may have been paid out to people who earned more than they anticipated, with an estimated one billion to be recovered. 
And he was really going to need that $1 billion because he had a lot of barrels to pork, hypothetical car parks to build, and mugs about being in surplus to sell. It's not easy being a small business operator. Occasionally you need to reach out to your community and unlawfully take money from them in order to keep you afloat. This task was undertaken by Morrison as though its accomplishment would single-handedly solve the national debt. At the same time, companies that had avoided or even evaded tax, estimated to be in the trillions, were ignored. Who says the coalition has no empathy? I see a ton of empathy on display. Trillions of it. At this point, it becomes more like the largest heist in history. Morrison gathers a crack team of MPs. He would use all of their skills, cunning and sociopathy to ensure the heist went off without a hitch. And who are Morrison's four? Well, there's Michael The Open Door Keenan. After temporarily pausing the process following mounting criticism, he reinstated it rather than discontinued it. There's Alan The Mouth Tudge who took to making ostentatious public announcements to broadcast the lengths to which the Morrison government would go to ensure that nobody got away with an extra dollar as follows. It will find you, it will track you down, and you ha will have to repay those debts, and you may end up in prison. There was Christian the Ignorer Porter, who ignored all criticism, such as from the administrative tribunal, like it was a rape allegation from a 16 year old, and implemented the scheme. And lastly, Stuart Relentless Robert. At one point, Stuart Robert tried to take $7,000 from a dead person, when about a year later, he claimed a total of $62,814.52 for his residential internet costs. But at no point did he apologise for RoboDebt. Instead, he defended the scheme. Now granted, this isn't the feeling everywhere in the department. Serena Wilson, a former Department of Social Services official, who was given the damning legal advice about the RoboDebt scheme being unlawful, told the Royal Commission she lacked the courage to personally tell former Prime Minister Scott Morrison the plan could be unlawful and was now ashamed, which is rare get for someone from the government. To be honest, even if she'd found the courage, it wouldn't have changed anything. Because once Morrison had seen the proposal, he wouldn't give up on it. Here we have a clip. I'm trying to find some money for the family. There's always money in the robot debt. Look, I'm sure you don't need to be told, dear listener, but this was a particularly cruel abuse of the Australian public, at scale by their own government, which persisted and was covered up for five years against overwhelming evidence that it should never have been allowed to begin. Which explains why ignorance of the law, I'm sorry, ignoring the law is an acceptable excuse for Australian citizens when doing something that causes stress, grievance, psychological harm, financial bullying and suicides. So it is only fair the government is afforded the same allowances. We are allowed to do that, right? I can say that, can't I? Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's right. But you can't spell RoboDebt without robbed. That's right. And this was one giant attempted robbery. A reverse Robin Hood taking from the many to give to the few. These thief princes. Compare this to the recent data hacks of companies like Optus, Medibank and Woolworths, which used information they had no right to access on mass scale as a means of taking advantage of the vulnerable population for the benefit of those using the data. But when the government does it, even after deliberately ignoring the advice of multiple legal entities and bulldozing your way through little people, then it, it's different somehow. At least according to them. Apparently it is better to think of this as a stuff up and not a conspiracy. Now I am tempted by this thinking because, well, for a conspiracy to be pulled off, it requires cunning and certainly a lack of bragging, right? You can't brag about successfully pulling off a conspiracy. And these corrupt people will never take a camera and turn it around and show them how many people are here. They never do it. 
They're corrupt. They never do it. You know, I never knew the cameras, because this took place right from, they never want to show how massive our crowd was. You know the biggest crowd I've ever seen? January 6th. And you never hear that. It was the biggest. And they were there, they were there largely to protest a corrupt and rigged and stolen election. Well, I mean, not, not if your country is functioning, you can't. Pretty sure. As someone who received one of these debts, it's hard to agree with this, but this wasn't a conspiracy, or a cabal, or even a collusion, but it was a classic coalition scam, yeah, that's right. This is fraud. That being, um, any act of deception carried out for the purpose of unfair, undeserved, and or unlawful gain, while a conspiracy is the act of two or more persons called conspirators working secretly to obtain some goal, usually understood with negative connotations. So it's definitely more in the fraud category than it would be in the conspiracy category. None of these people were working together. They all hoped to fly under the radar until their megalomaniac in charge either got bored or moved on. And he never moved on. It became his entire personality, like that friend of yours who did a trip to Europe once ten years ago and finds a way to wedge it into every conversation you have. The bit I'd call a conspiracy didn't kick in until the government came explaining themselves. And even that is more subterfuge, with the final goal being avoiding responsibility at all costs. Suddenly, Everyone knew how to work together to use the most weasel language that they could to avoid all the responsibility. Even after the scheme was wound up, Secretary of the Department of Social Services, Catherine Campbell, made sure to skillfully dodge blame with the language used to describe its unlawfulness, preferring the phrase, legally insufficient. You know, the way that we describe Mickey Rooney's portrayal of Mr. Yunioshi, not as racist, but insufficiently racially sensitive. Or my bank account, not as unfull, but rather financially insufficient. And the Morrison government, not as unempathetic, merely as empathetically insufficient. Rabbit is a clear case where the fundamental principles of governance which is a shared view between citizens and the state, has failed. Trust between government and the people was undermined. And let's be honest, there wasn't a lot to work with in the first place, due to an inability to establish a line of communication that is open, lacks an ego-driven sociopath looking to score points and climb the political ladder, and land as many photo shoots as possible on the way, nor create a system to correctly identify and review debts owed to the government that might take more than a couple of seconds to verify. Something like that might have stopped robo-debt victims from needing to borrow money or use their credit cards to pay their debts after Centrelink staff refused to help with inquiries. The Maury Champion reported in one case a young woman with a 12 thousand dollar debt was told by Centrelink they couldn't help and she should just pay up. Ah yes, the why not just dive into your money pile and pay up excuse. I always forget how much money I just have here just lying around. There's always so much of it. It's all so full. I'm not sure who snitched that I spend my evening sitting on a pile of gold like some sort of welfare smaug, but I'll find them and I will bury them alive in my mountain of gold. A Centrelink employee asked, why are you hoarding resources? Don't you know there are no ethical hundred heirs in capitalism? Catherine Eagle, Principal Solicitor for Perth's Welfare Rights and Advocacy Service said, they suggested she borrow the money. So she went to a payday lender and borrowed the money. Apparently working with a predatory payday lender felt safer than dealing with a government body responsible for the keeping of the poor and the vulnerable. After all, their motto is, 
giving you options. We just didn't read the fine print that states, while Centrelink isn't one of those options, death is. Miss Eagle said, the woman didn't seek any advice at the time, but became terrified when money started turning up in her account years later as a result of the class action payments. She was worried that she would be hit with another debt as a result of the money that she was receiving. Centrelink has people at the point where money appearing in their bank account terrifies them. A new economic strategy where we, as a society, are so traumatised by the sudden appearance of money in our accounts that we will spend it on any old shit, be it random knickknacks, donating to horrible political parties, the latest exploding phone from a tech company, and our most desperate attempts to separate ourselves from our money may even be to pay media or donate to Wikipedia. But don't get your hopes up guys, we'll probably just end up spending it on a back in black mug. This new economic model is called Angstonomics, and it's how we're going to save the economy.